dark nights, I started thinking about my next fossil entry. And I had some difficulty picking a topic until my youngest sister came over to visit me. Well, my half-sister, really. I have two full sisters, both younger than me, and a half-brother and a half-sister, although I really don't like the designation. Today, we were talking about snakes. My little sister loves snakes, and warriors' pets, and uh, the um, City of Bones series, and so on. Some time ago, I convinced her to watch the movie Anaconda with me, and that got us thinking about the mega anaconda known as Titanoboa. Fittingly, this also connects with the Ammonite entry because when I went to visit my cousins years ago in Okinawa, I bought one of my Ammonites. Uh, we also visited a zoo. At this zoo, we attended a snake show and the performer called me up to the stage to hold a giant snake around my neck and shoulders. Amusingly, I was also wearing a light gray shirt that day with a giant golden snake and chains, and that and the actual snake were very similar uh, in color. So that was fun. documentary on uh, the discovery and reconstruction of Titanoboa uh, that tells the story from it's from the Smithsonian Channel uh, titled Titanoboa Monster Snake. It's an hour and a half long and it's pretty much exactly the kind of show I used to spend hours watching in the evening. Uh, I would just eat up programs like this on the discovery or history or Smithsonian or Animal Planet in middle and early high school That'd be my entire evening after school. Uh, maybe that I'd play Pokemon. Uh, if you're into that kind of show, I highly recommend that one. Um, Netflix may still have it, if not instant, then for rent. Now, there's a really interesting technique of determining the size of a prehistoric snake in this, in this documentary. The scientists started with one vertebra, just one. What they did is first match the shape and features of the vertebra to the vertebrae of known snakes and find the closest match, the closest living relative. Then they take the shape of the vertebra and compare it to the shape of the vertebra of its closest living relatives to figure out where in the snake's body that vertebra lay, whether it was close to the head uh, the middle of the body, or closer to the tail, or part of the tail. This gives them an idea of the proportions of the other parts of the vertebrae and the entire body, and that way, an idea of the snake's appro approximate size. Uh, I myself would probably have looked for more of the skeleton first, but this is very clever, and it definitely worked. Now, if they had been dealing with an animal with, with no close living relatives, it wouldn't work as well. But when you do have a close living analogy, it's rather ingenious. Um, imagine you're a fossil hunter, or any adventurer, and you come across the fossils of a prehistoric creature. You have that animal in front of you, and if the skeleton is complete enough, you know what it looks like. If you have only a few fragments, there are ways to determine the kind of creature it was by looking at details in the bone. Uh, often the teeth are very helpful, even the, even the tiniest of details in each of the bones, uh, the teeth, the skull particularly, 
and the shapes of all of them. Then you can look at either similar finds in the fossil record and collections, or if there are any living relatives. However, what you still don't know is what kind of environment that creature lived in and how it lived. For that, you either have to know what kind of landscape or seascape uh, or waterscape um, existed at the time the fossil species lived, how to read the geology of the rocks around, or look at the other fossils you find in the vicinity. And this is what they did when unearthing Titanoboa. The plant fossils in the area turned out to be of the very first bean plants, as well as banana, palm trees, avocado. I don't like avocados, but that's beside the point. Uh, and chocolate. These are tropical plants, and what it me meant was that 60 million years ago, when Titanoboa lived, Sarahon was the first tropical rainforest to emerge after the end Cretaceous extinction. Uh, this was about five million years after, after the dinosaurs disappeared. Then, they had a vertebrate fossil specialist come in to look at the animal fossils, and what he found was an array of animal species very similar to what one finds in a wet tropical rainforest today. Uh, large fish, turtles, and crocodiles. And when the snake vertebrae were delivered to the lab, the two graduate scientists looking at them figured the snake would have stretched the entire length of the lab. And anyone who's been in a science laboratory is familiar with the fact that they're not small. In fact, eventually, when the size of the snake was put together, it was found that Titanoboa probably reached an adult length of 40 feet. Uh, the, the, specimen, the specimen they reconstructed was 48 feet, but many animals don't reach their maximum potential size, uh, so it would probably have been more likely to uh, in prehistoric Sierra Home to find Titanoboa of closer to 40 feet long. That's still more than twice as long as most large green anacondas, which are their closest living relatives. And estimates put them at ten times as heavy as the largest snakes today. There are legends of giant anacondas of 30 or 40 feet said to live in the rainforests of South America, even though they've never been proven. Now, most likely, these are based on exaggerations or overestimations of the size of anacondas that were in fact sighted, but it's tricky to judge the size of an animal uh, like that reliably without being very close to them, or knowing how to judge size based on the size of objects around them, uh, based on scales around them, uh, s some idea of what the proportions actually are. There have even been claims of 60 foot long anacondas, but again, you've got the same problem. The size of snakes, along with any cold-blooded animal, is closely tied with the climate of their environment. The warmer the environment, the larger a snake you can get up to a point, because they've still got the problem of fighting gravity. This is also why Titanoboa was almost certainly aquatic, uh, much like anacondas today. In water, an animal's weight is supported by the weight of the water, so they become effectively weightless. Uh, whereas on land, this is obviously not true. Uh, what you need to get a snake the size of Titanoboa, as the documentary explains near the end, is very hot temperatures. So Titanoboa's size is a clue to the climate of Sarahon 60 million years ago. Uh, there is also another clue, leaf fossils. A leaf loses water at its edges. A jagged edge means more surface area, so the leaf will lose more water. In hot climates, leaves need to retain more of their water, so they have straight edges, or a much larger proportion of them have straight edges, uh, less overall surface area. 
By looking at the ratio of smooth edge leaves to jagged edge leaves, you can get an idea of the climate that existed. And the scientist's estimate is that Titanoboa's ecosystem had an average annual temperature of 10 degrees hotter than the Amazon rainforest today. Titanoboa was one of the apex predators of the Cerrojón rainforest, along with the blunt-nosed crocodile that shared its habitat, uh, and a 40-foot crocodile species, uh, which would rank up with the largest crocodilians such as uh, Sarcosuchus and Dinosuchus. Uh, and the two would, uh, the giant crocodiles and Titanoboa, more than likely come into conflict many times. This would probably resemble encounters that we see today between caimans and anacondas in South America, uh, the invasive Burmese pythons and American alligators in the Florida Everglades, sometimes the snake winds, sometimes the crocodilian winds. Apex predators are in constant competition for food and territory, and always have been. As a giant constrictor, Titanoboa would have waited, submerged, for the opportune moment when a prey animal would come close. Then, with a blasting speed of a strike and a bite, coiled around its prey and squeezed its body ever tighter. until its blood flow and breathing stopped.